3.30 p.m. Um, St. Patty's Day dinner, it costs $12 per meal. Missal also offers meals for St. Patty's Day. Um, offer orders are due on March 8th, and pickup is on March 15th between 1 to 3.30. And if you want to like know what the meal set is, go visit our website. It's on the home page. Um, breakfast with the Easter Bunny. You can eat breakfast with the Easter Bunny on Saturday, April 6th from 9 to 11 a.m. It's $8 for adults, 5 for children, ages from 3 to 9, and 3 for children to 2 and younger. It's also $5 to get a picture of the Easter Bunny. <laughs> I just want everyone to know that the items that Haley just spoke about, the Breakfast with the Easter Bunny, the Irish American menu, as well as some of their made-to-go meals, there are flyers along the front. So if you're interested in those events, I know they're also on the website, but if you want to pick them up on the way out, Mrs. Dolan wanted to make sure that I mentioned them. So thank you both. Next up is the consent calendar. I'll uh, make a motion to approve the consent calendar, items A through I. Questions or comments from board members? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 7-0. Oh, sorry, 8-0, I didn't realize we have one more commit. Activities, Mrs. Walters. Okay, um, the activities committee did not meet in the month of February, and our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, March 5th. Thank you. Curriculum, Mrs. Collin. The curriculum committee also did not meet in February, and our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, March 4th. I, I believe the 4th is a Monday. Thank you. The facilities committee did meet earlier this evening, and uh, we have uh, four items from the uh, obsolete items. Um, and I'll make that in the form of a motion to uh, obsolete items A through C. I'll second. Questions or, questions or comments from board members? Facilities Committee meeting is scheduled for March 12th. Thank you. Okay, next is the Finance Committee. We have the approval of contracts. Does anyone need anything voted on separately? Okay, then I'll make a motion to approve contracts A through L. All questions or comments from board members? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 8-0. Okay, next is the approval of the Bucks County Intermediate Unit 2019-2020 budget. Um, <coughs> actually, I'll make a motion to approve the Bucks County Intermediate Unit's 2019-2020 programs and services and instructional materials and research services budget. Questions or comments from board members? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion passes 8-0. I'll make a motion to approve the 2019-2020 advertising of bids and RFPs A through H. Sorry. Questions or comments from board members? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 8-0. Make a motion to approve the proposal for engineering, project design, development, and construction administration. 
Questions or comments from board members? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 8-0. The next finance committee meeting is scheduled for March 12th, 2019. And the next <coughs> is the Bucks County Intermediate Unit Committee Report. The Bucks County Intermediate Unit launched the Ambassador Academy initiative in the fall of 2016. The purpose of the Ambassador Academy is to enhance the leadership abilities of a diverse group of Bucks County Intermediate staff members through the exploration of effective communication strategies and helpful tools that support professional growth. Members participated in five monthly sessions focused on the following topics, all about the IU, presentation skills, difficult conversations, body language, and emotional intelligence. These topics were used for small group presentations for board members at the last meeting, so we could see how these topics affect communication with others. The Bucks County Intermediate Unit is also the first school district or service agency in the country to receive meritorious budget awards from the Association of School Business Officials, international for 25 consecutive years in a row. So the first one ever to get it for 25 years in a row. The, this award demonstrates the highest standards of budgeting, transparency, process, and best practices. It's a great testament to the exceptional work of the Bucks County Intermediate Unit's business staff. And just a couple of other things. Um, Dr. Deb Locke, our dir the director of early childhood programs, had the privilege to be invited as a guest on Comcast Newsmakers. During an interview hosted by Comcast's Jill Horner, Dr. Locke talked about the importance of early childhood education for all children, regardless of income, developmental delays, or learning differences. You can watch the interview at ComcastNewsmakers.com, uh, and you can do a search for the early childhood. Uh, we talked about in prior meetings, but uh, we didn't talk about the Percocy one. There's sensory story time at the libraries, and um, there is one at Percocy, the, the first, the first three Mondays of every month from 11.30 to 12.30, we have one in Percocy. And the first three Tuesdays of every month, it's, there's one in Quakertown from 10.30 to 11.30. And last but not least, the Bucks County Intermediate Unit uh, was um, honored to have been awarded PA Smart Advancing Grants in the amount of $900,000 to expand computer science and STEM education. The first grant is for $412,656 and it will support the creation of a mobile fab lab and related educational programs. The mobile fab lab will serve as a platform for learning and innovation, a place to play, to create, to learn, and to invent by providing students with project-based hands-on STEM education. The mobile fab lab will travel throughout the county. The second grant in the amount of $484,689 will fund the Computational Thinking in Action program. This will engage regional teams throughout Pennsylvania to create a middle school introductory course on computer science and a curriculum for an after school program in robotics and computer science. The next committee report is personnel. Dr. Yarnell. Thank you. Uh, we did have a personnel committee meeting uh, on February 4th. Uh, some of the outcome of that meeting are two of the motions tonight and, of course, the discussion about the school police officer position. There is also a motion on the agenda that was not discussed that night about considering tenure recommendations. So the first motion that came from that discussion is the one to approve a new director of transportation to replace uh, Mr. Geiger, who's retiring at the end of the year. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I mo move to approve Jessica Short as the new director of transportation. Her salary will be $83,718, and her effective date as this position is July 1, 2019. Questions or comments from board members? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
Opposed? Motion carries 8-0. Thank you. The second motion is to approve uh, new, job, new and revised job descriptions. They are for the Communications and Public Relations Coordinator. This is uh, the provision of Mr. Ferry's position uh, as he is retired. And then also for a K-12 uh, Supervisor of Mathematics, so Science, Social Studies, and Reading and Language Arts. Um, and those positions are changed in terms of there are currently six supervisory positions in those four disciplines. Uh, that would be reduced under the proposal the administration has made to four, the, the uh, consequence revide, revision of the um, job descriptions to fit the new positions. So I make that in the form of a motion. So. Questions or comments from board members? As I mentioned at the committee meeting, I am not going to support this. I will abstain from this motion, uh, not because of the public relations part, but because of the supervisor part. The, I know that this is part of the upcoming budget discussion. I would prefer to um, wait until the discussion has happened and to see whether this uh, proposal is accepted. I personally am not in favor of the proposal as uh, provided. And so I will abstain on this particular motion tonight. Any other comments or questions from board members? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? And I abstain. Okay, the motion passes 801. 701. 701. 701. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. The third issue is the discussion on the school police officer position. Specifically tonight, there is also a job description um, for that position. Uh, that would be both the police, school police officer, the SPO, so-called, slash director of security. That would be one of the new two new positions. The other would be just the school police officer, SPO. The job description is uh, something that was discussed at the committee meeting and is contained here. And um, I move that this uh, job de description be accepted. Uh, Dr. Yell, if, if it's appropriate, I would ask that we not move on the job description and just hold the discussion. Then that's uh, fine with me. I think, I, I think it was confusing because they're not usually posted. I just wanted them publicly so people could see the job description. But I, I think that we ought to have the discussion and then if we need to move on the job description, we can do that next month, if, if you're comfortable. Uh, I would have abstained okay. for the same reason as the previous one, so I'm more than comfortable with that. Please wait for me one second. I think you should probably start. Sure. Thank you. Uh, first, I'm going to ask Mr. Miller, our solicitor, uh, just to provide some of the legal background. Um, as there were some questions regarding qualifications and training, and who are these people, and who can you hire, and what do they have to do annually and, and those types of requirements. So since the, those are all specified in the law, which is primarily Act 44, I'm going to ask Mr. Miller to start and give us an overview of some of those things. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Dr. Bolton. And um, let me also start by thanking the individuals in the audience who previously spoke. Um, uh, many of you made uh, uh, cogent, clear points. Um, all of you were respectful. And um, because I get to be a parliamentarian, it's no fun being a parliamentarian. So much for staying within the time frames. Um, Mr. O'Connor and I, I believe some other uh, individuals, I wrote their names down, uh, raised questions, I think reasonable questions about um, who can do what under Act 44. Um, and so um, let me try to um, uh, provide some context for everyone. Um, I may or may not answer everyone's questions, but let me do my, my very best. Um, with the provisio, with the understanding for everyone um, that the most recent guidance um, uh, for Act 44 was released by PDE, uh, I think, on Friday. Um, so um, it's very much a fluid um, situation. Uh, but essentially, uh, the world is divided into uh, three things for purposes of security at schools. There are school resource officers, which many people have mentioned, and 
Um, that's pretty clear and defined in and of itself. That's a law enforcement op officer who is employed by a municipality um, who is co-located in a school and operates uh, by virtue of their existing law enforcement powers um, uh, through a cooperative arrangement with a uh, school district. That's the school resource officer. There is a school police officer provided for in Act 44. A school police officer is an employee of the school district who has certain um, uh, powers uh, provided to uh, him or her um, uh, through court order. Um, and then the third category are school security guards. According to the guidance provided by the Department of Education, guidance which we briefed the board on previously, school security guards are not able to be armed. Um, they, they are not permitted to carry weapons uh, under uh, the provisions of Act 44. Um, they may be school police officers if they're hired into that capacity, but they are not by virtue of uh, their position as uh, security guards permitted to carry weapons. Um, uh, let me go back to the category that seems to have um, uh, attracted the most comment. Um, that's school police officer. School police officer under the statute, and I'm sorry, I have my cheat sheet, and I also apologize, my daughter's put that sticker on, my, on the back of my uh, computer, and they're all in trouble for doing that. <laughs> um, but uh, that is a, a law enforcement officer who's employed by a school district. Um, and they are, they, can, they come in kind of two um, circumstances. One is either an employee of the school uh, entity uh, directly, um, or um, a school entity may uh, contract with retired federal agents or retired state, uh, municipal, or military police officers or sheriffs to provide um, services. Those individuals um, who are um, uh, uh, the independent contractors must undergo what's known as MOPEC training. That's Municipal Police Officers Education and Training Commission located in Hershey, Pennsylvania, across from Hershey Park. Um, and they are the entity which license municipal police officers across the state. They, uh, they license what's known as Act 120 training. It is the card which allows someone to act as a municipal police officer and gives them police powers. Um, uh, and uh, anybody who um, is hired as an independent contractor has to um, uh, uh, undergo annual training uh, by MOPEC. Um, any individual who is hired by an SPO must take an oath, must wear a shield, etc., 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 and upon appropriate motion to a judge of the Court of Common Pleas within the county, within the school district, is located. Um, a school police officer has uh, the power if the judge signs off on it. And judge, lots of judges will decide what they want to do. Uh, gives uh, the SPO the power to arrest, uh, the authority to issue citations, the authority to detain students until the arrival of local uh, law enforcement or any combination uh, therein. Um, a school police officer under, the, under Act 44 um, has the power to enforce good order in school buildings, school buses, school grounds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if authorized by the court, in other words, if signed off by the court, um, have the powers exercised by uh, the authority of law or ordinance of the police of the municipality um, and to issue summary citations. In other words, they have the ability to um, act as police officers on school grounds. That's where their jurisdiction um, is, uh, is enforceable. In order to carry a firearm as a school police officer under the current version of Act 44, you must have completed MOPEC training, i.e. police officer training, i.e. Act 120 certification, or have graduated from the Pennsylvania State Police Academy and been employed as a state trooper and separated service in good standing prior to being able to carry a weapon on school grounds. And so um, to the question, I think the, the reasonable question raised by many people, um, are there standards? There are certainly standards and they are enumerated in the law which we are bound um, to follow. Uh, will those standards stay static? I, well, I highly doubt it. I mean, I think PD will continue to provide guidance on, on 
of that circumstance. But uh, MOPEC training um, uh, does have a specific um, uh, firearms training component, um, as uh, many individuals have uh, remarked upon. And so um, uh, the whatever policy decision the board makes, we are bound to incorporate those requirements already set forth in Act 44 um, before we provide somebody with a weapon who can uh, carry it on school grounds if that person is not already a law enforcement officer for another municipality. And so um, two things, two small takeaways, and then I, before Dr. Uh, Bolton longs me, um, uh, two, I think two uh, quick takeaways. One is, um, anybody who is going to exercise police powers on school property must be approved by a judge of the Court of Common Pleas before they do that. There is no magical wand which gets waved and will convert somebody into a school police officer absent court approval. Secondly, and more uh, importantly, any person authorized to carry a firearm has to undergo the appropriate amount of training already identified in the law and established either by uh, the Municipal Police Officers Education and Training um, Commission or the State Police Academy, both of which are, are, are relatively rigorous training. Dr. Bolton, I yield my time. Thanks, Mr. Miller, I do appreciate that. Just one uh, clarifying question, and you may have said it, I may have missed it. So the continuing training requirements for a school police officer versus a Penridge Regional Police Officer there would be the same requirements of annual recertifications, whatever the trainings and requirements are for a police officer would be the same as for a school police officer. Well, the, neither PDE or Act 44 is definitive on that point. It would be my recommendation as solicitor that a person who is authorized to carry a gun um, will have to go to the two-year annual recertifications. And quite frankly, I think about it be um, yearly or six months. Um, uh, because, of course, uh, uh, it is a skill which must be practiced in order to be done well. So, Thank you for that clarification. And I do just want to clarify from a training standpoint, obviously, sorry about that, I do want to clarify from a training standpoint that obviously there is a difference between a community police officer and a police officer that would be in schools in terms of the basic clientele and the people that they will be interacting with. So in addition to police officer trainings, things like guns and firearms and restraints and all the things that police officers would, would be trained in, we also have budgeted an amount for training for things that are specific to school resource officers or school police officers. There are regular trainings that are offered uh, locally. Uh, there was one in Doylestown about three months ago that was a school uh, resource officer, school police officer training process that was a two-day training for them to talk about things specific to school settings um, that would be different, as well as we're gonna provide educational training from a standpoint of what's the best way to de-escalate a 16-year-old, because that may be very different from de-escalating a 30-year-old um, someplace in the city, uh, things like that. So those trainings will be part of what we will do, and actually we budgeted money to train all of our security guards in those things, um, but obviously the school police officers, if approved, would have additional trainings beyond that because of their responsibility. So I just wanted, I wanted to clarify that, clarify that from the training standpoint. I also want to thank the committee members who came out and, and the, and the um, ones who have emailed the board or myself um, or called us earlier, I do appreciate that. There really were two main purposes to put this on the agenda tonight. One was to hear from the community and to give us time to interact with this material, give people a chance to read the job description, hear from each other and also hear uh, from the board, but also provide some information uh, that we need to base on the history as well as the emails I've received and the comments from tonight. So I wanna do that for you. First and foremost, I wanna say very clearly and, and, and very uh, loudly at the beginning that the number one thing we do is to care for the psychological and the physical safety of our students that are staff. There is not one thing that we do or choose not to do that will fix either of those things. We need to continually and will continue to have the conversation about how do we best address the psychological safety as well as the physical safety of all of our students and all of our staff members. So I don't want to lose in this conversation that what we are talking about is much larger than one issue and we need to make sure that we don't lose focus of that. 
I am personally proud, as I've been in Penridge for seven months and have studied what has happened with this, to be able to enumerate multiple things in both categories because they are important to this board, they are important to our teachers, they are important to our parents. And so it's vital that we do that. From a psychological standpoint, we have designed curriculum specific for mental health that we deliver to students at key grade levels. Right? We have increased the number of social workers in the last two years that are available to our students. We have, um, are in the process of approving a guidance curriculum that will present some of these topics K through 12 to all of our students that is required by law. We've uh, created threat assessment teams. The comprehensive plan has three goals. One of them is around the mental and uh, psychological uh, wellness of our students. And so there are multiple steps within the comprehensive plan that deals with that. Rachel's challenge is an example of that, right? We are caring for our community and giving resources and education to our staff, and in this case, our parents and our students on very important mental health topics. There are multiple assemblies. Those of you who have students at school know that there are routinely assemblies that talk about being kind, that talk about caring for each other um, at different levels, as well as our advisory, our homerooms, our morning meetings, right? We do have teachers who are daily caring for kids. You could all tell me stories of teachers who have cared for your kids, right? And so that is part of what we do on a daily basis. From a physical safety, there are also things that we've done. You know about cameras, you know about entryways, you know about Raptor, you know about the drills we do, you know about the ALICE protocol. The SPO and the, it really was an SRO conversation until about four months ago, but the conversation about an armed police officer in the high school has been part of those conversations. It is not a new conversation and it has been part of that conversation. Actually, the data I found and the history I found, the conversation of an SRO was had with the townships and the police department and the administration before the conversation around Alice Trails. So from a timing standpoint, this is not a reaction, right? Now this is still a reaction culturally, but it's a reaction and a conversation that has been going on for at least four years, which is the data I could find. There is lots of conversation regarding data, right? And I'm a math geek and I'm a self-proclaimed math geek. And so I will not have a conversation without data and without research. I do want to say and be very clear, it is impossible to track the impact of any one